Bella Salon and Day Spa, located at 41 West Main Street in Northeast Pennsylvania, proudly supports Chautauqua Sunrise and its volunteers. More information at bellasalonanddayspa.net. Westfield Memorial Hospital provides high quality health care to residents of Western New York offering patients the most sophisticated medical advancements while keeping the ease and familiarity of a community hospital. Support for Chautauqua Sunrise has been provided by WRFA 107.9 FM, Jamestown's public radio station, streaming online 24-7 at WRFALP.com. Low power to the people. Chautauqua Sunrise is made possible by a grant from Fredonia Place, a continuing care retirement community providing dignity in a modern luxury environment. Meter's Restaurant, a family tradition for over 50 years in downtown Ripley, is a proud supporter of Chautauqua Sunrise. Meter's provides all day dining, banquet services, and custom catering, specializing in pie. From the Access Chautauqua Studios in Mayville, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Chautauqua Sunrise is hosted by Doc Hamels and supported by the award-winning volunteers at Access Chautauqua. We are here to share local news, colorful interviews, and events of interest to everyone. Chautauqua Sunrise is broadcast live Saturday mornings each week from 9 to 10 a.m. Send events via email or call us live. Check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And now, from the Access Chautauqua Studios, it's Chautauqua Sunrise. Here we are again, folks. Good morning and welcome to Chautauqua Sunrise. I'm so glad you could join us here this Saturday morning. A little dreary out there, but it's promising to be a better uh, afternoon from what I understand, so it shouldn't dampen too much of our, our, our plans for today. Happy fall. We made it. Got through summer, but it, summer seems to linger on here, and I'm happy about that. I don't even think we're into Indian, Indian uh, what the heck do you call that? Indian summer yet. Um, hopefully, that'll be later on in, in, in the fall. But uh, it's, it's been really pretty nice weather. I kind of liked it. And um, still good weather for riding your bike out there and taking long walks and that. So anyways, good morning. Also, good afternoon to all my listeners on WRFA 107.9. Low power to the people. Thanks for joining us. I guess the show's over. <laughs> These guys do this to me all the time just to see if I'm looking at the monitor. I'm sure of it. Anyways. Uh, good afternoon to everybody in the Jamestown area that's listening in. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, as always, I think you're going to really enjoy our show today. And uh, this is one of those shows I think you might want to refer to from time to time because it's, I know it's going to sound weird, educational. It's going to be educational. It's going to be something that uh, people out there can use and uh, share with other people. And you'll understand in a little bit. I don't want to give it all away. Hey, this is a live show this morning as always. And if you want to give, well, not always, but 98% of the time, sometimes we do pre-tapes. But uh, we are live today, and if you want to give us a call, have a question for me, my guest, if you have an announcement for uh, your club, organization, or whatever, give us a call at 753-5225. Randy's on the other end of the line, and he's really a lot of fun to talk to. Okay, so uh, he'll be happy to take your call, plug it in. I listen to you on my earpiece, or we listen to you through the wall there, and... Uh, We'll have a great conversation. Uh, Linda Spalding calls in just about every other week. It's real easy. And if you have a club or organization that has like a zero budget for advertising, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. We're happy to share it with you. And as you know, my, my yellow sheets here, uh, we, we announce a variety of different things uh, that are happening throughout the area. And it's all about Chautauqua County, okay? And also you can go to our website. You can go to our Facebook page. You can go to our uh, you can find us on YouTube forever, show 274, Justin, I kept track this week, right? <laughs> He's chucking his uh, 
is uh, yeah, wearable technology there. Okay, uh, as I was uh, riding around yesterday, I joined some folks down in Northeast Pennsylvania, and uh, we were riding out in Law Road, I guess it was, and boy, I'll tell you one thing, you can smell grapes right now. Oh yeah, and uh, they're harvesting pumpkins and getting ready for Halloween, and just a fun time of the year, and the weather's pretty darn decent. Uh, I do want to also caution you that you got to be careful because if they are harvesting in your area or if you're coming along the lakeshore, people are zooming around. They're busy. They're, they're getting those grapes in and there's uh, trucks and pickers and all kinds of stuff. So just kind of slow down. Keep, keep an awareness that it's a busy time of year out here in uh, Chautauqua County. All right. Um, I guess I'm going to stop at that, and I'm going to go through my announcements that some people have shared. But again, don't be bashful. Send it to us, and uh, don't hesitate to do that because it's free. All right, we're going to start with uh, Rolling Hills Radio. All right. So if you don't know what Rolling Hills Radio is, I'll, I'll kind of give you my own version of it. It's a, a radio show that's live. Okay, it's over at Shaw Bucks in Jamestown. Ken Hartley is the uh, the Godfather creator. He gave birth to this whole concept. He's been doing it for about ten years, and he brings in um, musicians from all over the country, really. And uh, it's kind of folksy, but it's not always folksy. But I mean, it's, it has a, fun, a folksy country Americana sound, and you just never know quite what the genre is going to be this particular month, and he's starting his season out. And uh, I'm going to tell you all about it. I went to see Tom Paxton a while ago. Awesome, awesome, awesome. You're up close and personal with these people, and if anybody that comes into town as the, as the months go by, you can greet, meet, you can shake hands, you can say, you know, I've got all your albums or whatever. You can get signatures. So it's just a great, great venue. So let's have a read here. Rolling Hills Radio will present renowned Nashville songwriter, guitarist, performer, Daryl Scott for the opener of season 10. Four-time Grammy nominee, Daryl Scott is one of the most respected songwriters and performers in Americana. His outstanding musicianship has led to cl collaborations with Robert Plant, Emmy Lou Harris, Guy Clark, Chris Cornell, Jim Lauderdale, Rascal Flatts, Olivia Newton-John, Hypnotic, Lambake, and many, many more. Songs he's written have covered, uh, have been covered by the Dixie Chicks, who scored a hit with his song Long Time Gone, Garth Brooks, Brad Paisley, Patty Loveless, and Travis Tritt. Now I use the term Americana, and uh, there's his picture right there. Stunning, I love that guitar. Um, Americana is sort of a, a thing that you know when you hear it, and it's really kind of roots of America sound. It can be folks, it can be bluesy, it can be bluegrass, it can be a little bit of rock in there. It's just kind of a blend of sounds and when you hear it, you know that it's not something else. And uh, so I, I would ask you to check it out. Ken Berenger, executive director of entertainment for Buffalo Sportsman Tavern, says this about Daryl. Eight years ago, I had the good fortune to bring Daryl Scott to Sportsman Tavern and have been trying to secure him ever since. Daryl is always more than busy, doesn't tour often, and seldom gets to the Northeast. The world has many great songwriters, and Daryl Scott ranks right up there at the top. If you don't know Daryl, look him up and thank me Monday, September 30th, when he performs as part of Rolling Hills Radio. Uh, I'll be in attendance, and you should be too. Ken Harley says this, on this show, not only will we, will we be able to get Daryl's thoughts on his art in the state of music today, but this guy knows everyone in Americana, so interviewing him will not only reveal a lot about songwriting and performing, but maybe he can tell us some stories about the many interesting characters in this genre, not to mention the great music that he is going to play for us. Also, September 30th marks the first show of the Rolling Hills Radio 10th season. Uh, Harley says this, this has been an amazing experience all the way through the decade of the 2010s. Not only did Rolling Hills uh, bring Americana to Jamestown, but Amer uh, Jamestown has welcomed this genre with great enthusiasm. On a national level, people in the industry and their fans are familiar with what we do and need little convincing to have them uh, make the trip to our part of the world. For that, we have the community of Jamestown to thank. Okay, all live uh, Rolling Hills radio 
Regular season shows take place at Shawbucks. Across from Jamestown Ice Arena, doors open to all those holding or purchasing tickets at 5.30 for the Rolling Hills Happy Hour. Food and drink are available until 6.15, at which time the audience members take their seats and the house lights dim. Audio and video recordings begin at 6.30. The bar reopens for 10 minutes at intermission and then again after the show when the audience and performers are invited to a meet and greet, like I was telling you about. There are three op options for purchasing tickets. Until the show is sold out, tickets are available at the door uh, the night of each show. If you choose, you can call Rolling Ticket Hotline at 294-0416. Tickets are also available online at rollinghillsradio.org backslash tickets. Tickets for the September and February shows are only $25. All others are $15. I tell you, this is a bargain. You're going to see Grammy Award-winning musicians, people that have written for the stars, and you get to see them for next to nothing. This project is made possible with funds funds from the Decentralization Program, a re-grant program of the New York State Council on the Arts, <clears throat> with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature and administered by the Tri-County Arts Council. Moving along. We have another activity going on here called the Free Presentation on Early History of County Brewers and Beers set for October 12 in Jamestown. Oktoberfest! What could be better? Chautauqua County is experiencing a beer renaissance with numerous microbreweries and craft beer establishments currently operating in several local communities. But those businesses currently in operation are just the latest in a long line of bottlers and brewers uh, and breweries that have existed both in be, uh, before and after Prohibition. On Saturday night, October 12, Chautauqua County Historical Society trustee and historian Bob Johnson will focus on some of those past brewing operations with a program entitled The Early History of Chautauqua County's Brewers, Bottlers, and Beers. The program is free and open to the public. Johnson plans to speak to what early county residents were doing when it came to the beer trade up to the end of Prohibition. He'll offer a rundown of early brewers and baller history and artifacts. He'll also explain what's gone and what still remains, including the mundane, interesting, and sometimes macabre uh, in details of the early brewing industry. Macabre. What, what could possibly happen with a brewery? Hmm. Johnson is not only uh, a trustee with the Historical Society, but he's also the founder and driving force behind the Jamestown Street Railway Trolley Car 93 Restoration Project. That's a mouthful. He also is the organizer of the annual Westfield Book and Paper Show, taking place each year uh, on the first Saturday in May. To coincide with the topic, the Historical Society is partnering with a newly opened local brewing establishment in presenting uh, this special program. It will take place at 6 p.m. October 12th inside the Jamestown Brewing Company at 119 West 3rd Street. Jamestown, sounds like a lot of fun. There's no cost to attend the presentation and the event is free to the general public. A variety of food and refreshments will be available for sale uh, before or after the program. In addition, some of the brewery's product will also be available for sale during the presentation, and the business will also offer a tour of the new brewing operation at the end of Johnson's presentation, tentatively set for 7 p.m. If you're interested, give them a call at 326-2977, or go to the McClurg Mansion, no, excuse me, I always say that wrong, Mc, the uh, McClurgMuseum.org, uh, and check them out. Okay, let's continue on here, page three. Near and dear to my heart, my Rotary Club, Westfield Mabel uh, Rotary, is having their annual Gold Rush. Let's pop that up, Jeff. Okay, this is going to be held on September 19th. No, did I just say September 19th? Saturday, October 19th. Excuse me, I'm in the wrong month. Okay, let me do that again. Saturday, October 19th. Easton Hall in Westfield, $30 per ticket. Dinner, 6 p.m., and the dinner includes uh, chicken and roast beef sandwich and potatoes and all kinds of good stuff. Let's see. Tickets to $30 only. Now you might say that $30. Yeah, but listen what happens here. After dinner, we start to draw out tickets in reverse order. We pick out every 10th ticket is a winner. Sometimes it's a $50 winner. Sometimes it's a $20 winner. And we get 
we pick out every single ticket and the last ticket is drawn is a thousand dollar winner and every year uh, we give away a thousand dollars I've been the MC for this thing probably for the last I don't know eight or nine years and it's a lot of fun and what I encourage people to do uh, is bring snacks and uh, adult beverages of their choice they can bring those into the Easton Hall and throughout the evening you can you know kick back have a lot of fun we try to keep it light and and move it along and just have a great night uh, tickets must be purchased uh, if you want a dinner by October 12th if you're interested I give Linda uh, done a call at 326-3012 for tickets uh, you don't need to be present and there's also gonna be a 50-50 drawing and a basket raffle okay there's a thing here that came from the Chamber of Commerce and just to let you know that October is manufacturing month and uh, they are celebrating the fact that you know they bring in zillions of dollars of, of, of money into Chautauqua County every year and uh, let's see on October 17th the Manufacturers Association is uh, presenting Protocol 80 uh, at Chautauqua Suites. The mission of this event is to provide education to manufacturers that will help them reach more prospects and generate more sales. October 18th, the next day, is the popular Tech Tour uh, Day co coordinated by the Manufacturers Association, Dream It, Do It, and JCC. And uh, if you're interested, get a hold of uh, the folks over at uh, they, um, they call it Mass, but at the uh, at JCC at the um, Manufacturers Association and uh, check things out on their website. Oh, there's my buddy Tim Piazza. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, if you're interested, you have to get a hold of Tim Piazza. You go T Piazza at Mast M A S T uh, hyphen WesternNewYork.com. Okay. Now just sort of a general announcement, just letting people know that things are going on in Chautauqua County for manufacturers. And finally, let's bring up our last pick, and this is, uh, to let you know this coming weekend, not this weekend, but next week, October 4 and 5 is going to be Harvest Moon Part 2, presented by the Lakeshore Center for the Arts. And uh, Rick Mascara was here a while back, and this is going to be a fun night, and at the same time a very moving night. Rick has written in a play with 16 different personalities that are going to be covered. Six uh, individuals will actually portray the six people, and the, uh, the balance will be uh, talk, uh, those individuals will be talked about by a family member or somebody from the community that knew that person. Uh, so it's going to be quite, quite the thing. I've seen part of it already, and I got goosebumps because it takes us back to World War II. Any World War II veteran is welcome to attend free of charge one or both nights. Show starts at 8 p.m. It's at the Presbyterian Church. And if you are interested for more information, give me a call at 224-2135. And tickets are $15. It's going to be at the Presbyterian Church. And if you don't know where it is, it's right across the street from the Westfield Library right there on Portage Street. All right, so I'm done with my announcements. We're going to take a little breather, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. My name is Carly, I'm 15 years old and I am a heart recipient. I got my first heart transplant when I was one and a half years old. I got my second heart when I was 13. When I get my driver's license, of course I'm gonna say yes to be an organ donor. I've been saved twice, so who says I can't save somebody else? This gift of life was made possible by an organ donor. Imagine what you could make possible. Sign up as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Go to organdonor.gov. Message and thing, something to think about. Um, people are out there needing organs that uh, are failing on them, and it's it's always a good thing to to share what we have if we don't long, no longer need them. Okay, with that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our show today. All right, y'all have been watching this show for the last six years, perhaps. I've had a murder mystery writer here, sci-fi, a western novelist. We had uh, two, two writers that uh, wrote about adolescence and teenagehood. I had Jim McQuiston here about Oak Island, the, the, the curse of Oak Island, and, and so forth. Well, today we're going to talk about something that you can buy, you can read, and it'll make life better for you if you happen to be a teacher. So I want to welcome today Jeff Julian, someone that I've known for 
on and off over the years. So, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Really happy to be here. All right. So, uh, you're none of the, 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 the areas that I mentioned. It's not a mystery book. It's, it, it's not a sci-fi. This is like a, something you can actually sit down and do something with. Absolutely. Um, I've had a long and very happy career as a teacher, mm -hmm. and I wanted to pass along some of the things I picked up through the years to um, the, the folks who are entering the profession for the first time. And uh, so I, I wrote a book about it, and I, I think it'll help um, some of the young teachers out there. Okay, so let's hold that thought. We're going to come back to that. That's, that's just like our intro. That's our little teaser line there. Jeff, where do you come from? What do you, like, like, what's your background? Well, I grew up in, in Dunkirk, New York, and uh, went to school uh, there at Dunkirk High School. Um, went to Fredonia State and got a bachelor's in English, bachelor's in history, and, uh, and then a master's in English. You have two bachelor's um, degrees? Yeah, well, it was, uh, I had a, I completed both majors with the complete requirements for both. Okay. And then was certified for both social studies and English. Oh, that's cool. And then, and then I went on for my master's in English. But uh, it wasn't quite that much of a straight line. I had been an engineering major at first, and um, I had wanted the security. Uh, there were a lot of people hiring engineers at that point. And there was a certain professor. I was taking a required history class and um, the assignment was to do a, a presentation to the class about uh, a certain politician. And the one I was assigned to was Ronald Reagan, who happened to be the president at the time. So uh, I you just began. You just dated yourself. Sure. <laughs> okay. It was a long time ago. No doubt. No doubt. And uh, so I was up there in front of the class, and um, someone asked a question. And uh, then someone else asked a question. And it became a discussion. And the feeling that I had from that was just just an, an electric feeling of, I uh, felt like I was conducting an orchestra of, of ideas and uh, thoughts that were passing back and forth. And it became, uh, I realized this, this was a really enjoyable experience. Um, the professor, uh, his name was Dr. Joseph Gallagher, he took uh, a minute to say to me, it was the very last day of the course, uh, and walking out of the building, just before I left the classroom, he said, oh, by the way, I was meaning to say to you, you, uh, you really ought to consider becoming a teacher. You know, and I uh, <laughs> said, well, uh, I'm going to be Whoa, an engineer. From, yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really ever consider that. And um, he said, well, I think you'd make a very fine, a very fine teacher. And uh, I walked out of that building, Thompson Hall at Fredonia State, and uh, you know, it was a dark sky and the snow was just starting to come down and I looked up in the sky and it was like one of those moments, like in the Blues Brothers where they get, you know, <laughs> boom, <laughs> like an epiphany. And I thought, yes, this is what I'm going to do. I, I think I would really get a lot of satisfaction from that. And so I uh, switched my major and I guess it's a testament to uh, a teacher who takes just a, a moment and makes one small comment and it can change a person's life completely. I'm going to tell you a story that's almost identical. Great. Ready? Sure. All right. So there I am working on my administration degree, and you probably had Bob Heisberger for anything? I knew he was there. All right. Well, he was like the guru of administration and so forth. Right. And so I'm like in my second class with this guy, and I really didn't know him very well. And, you know, you're trying to do well. There you are. You know, you're, you're a seasoned teacher at this point, and you, and you, you, you know, you think, like, I, I can handle all this college work. So I'm sitting there, and, and he says, um, this is before I was Dr. Hamels, he says, Mr. Hamels, mm -hmm. he says, uh, can I see you out in the hall? Y'all know what that means, right? I'll see you in the hall after class? Like, what have I done? I mean, I'm, I'm a quiet guy. Maybe I say a few things under my breath. But, I, you know, I, I, I thought, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. I must have blew the test or something. So I was sweating, and I don't sweat hardly ever. So uh, this is it for Donia State. I forgot what, Thompson Hall? Is that where education is? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm out in the hallway, and he comes up to me and said, you have a gift. It was like you said, the sky is open. I'm like, yeah. what? He says, you have a gift for writing. He said, you should get your doctoral degree. That from that day forward, I started my PhD, and here I am, whatever it is, 20-some years later, 30 years later. Amazing. But... It, but 
But this is the, the theme that's going to run through the rest of our show today. Yeah. Is what you're doing right now in this show and what I'm going to talk about is somebody was looking out for us. Absolutely. And there's always somebody looking out for the, for the next guy. And in this case, it was a, a professor looking out for a student. So, but before we do that, one more teaser. We'll get to that. You do something else besides teach. You do something really fun. Sure. Uh, play in a band called The Untouchables. Uh, we play all around the area. Uh, party music from every decade, 50s through the 80s. Maybe a little bit of a Blues Brothers sort of a look. and uh, A and little? Feel. Yeah. <laughs> we just, we, we, we I saw their, you guys. <laughs> we yeah. took their look a little bit, sure. But uh, have a great time. We have a really, really good time. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a, a group of guys that are um, very enjoyable to play with. It helps make life interesting and fun. Same band, 20 years. Uh, absolutely. 20 years I've been with that particular group, yeah. That's and, uh, almost hard to believe. Please because... check out our website. It's at uh, theuntouchables.tk and come out and see us sometime. I saw you in Ripley uh, this summer. Was That's it this right. Summer? It was That's a lot right. of fun. And you got this Dan Aykroyd thing going, I noticed. <laughs> but you play saxophone and play it very, very well. Thank you. And let's, let's roll back the tape for everybody, too, because you and I actually played together back in what, the 80s? I was going to bring that up to you because that's a significant moment in my life. It was uh -oh. the first time that I had ha played music in any form to my students, which then became a pretty big deal later on. Uh, I don't know if you recall, uh, it was a chorus concert where they put together a little band to accompany the chorus. Mm -hmm. You and I were in that little band. There was, I, I can tell who the players were, I think. Yeah. Let's see if we do it. I think I it can. was Eric Wills was on drums. Right. Uh, Ralph Casafaba was on bass. You were playing sax, I was playing guitar, and then Sue Hammond, I think, was playing tambourine or something. Well, it turns out the students responded in a way all out of proportion to our talent. <laughs> it was like Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, really. But what it taught me is that if you stick your neck out just a little bit for the students, yeah. it's something that they appreciate. I don't remember that year. Do you remember it was? Yeah, I do. That was 87, 87, 88 uh, school year. In, in fact, I was visiting my parents down in Florida recently, and uh, we were watching the old VHS tapes of home movies, and the clip of that show came on. I hadn't even remembered it, and just the auditorium went crazy uh, oh with these God. kids. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So it taught me an important lesson as a teacher. You know, be willing to put yourself out there a little bit. Yeah. 87. I was yeah. a board member at that time. I, and I, you know, I owe you a debt of gratitude for uh, hiring me and uh, giving me my first <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> well, the administration makes those recommendations. We basically kind of go along with that. But you're, you're welcome. And it was a lot of fun. And I remember the, the two of us playing together. And, yeah. and I, I said, geez, the saxophone goes really well with the guitar. And they do. The, their voices are very similar as far as the sound and the the. the well, anyways, the Definitely. tones. So it's, all right, well, and, and as you know, I continued on with music, and you did too, and sometimes we cross paths, so that's terrific. Sure. All right, so let's get to the heart of the matter. We're talking, we've, we've teased out the fact that you, um, that you were mentored, I was mentored by people, they saw something in us. So at what point did you decide you're gonna write a book? I mean, this is not a small task from what I've been told. Absolutely. I credit that to my son, Brian. He's a teacher down in Sarasota, Florida. You have a son that's a teacher? I, I do. You I don't do. look and it, old enough to well, have a son that's a that teacher. That is very kind. Thank you. I have a daughter who's an occupational therapist as well. Um, cool. But my son, as a teacher, uh, inspired me to write this book. Uh, not because he needs the book, as he's very skilled, but he encouraged me. Uh, it started when I went to Fredonia State to speak to some prospective teachers who were just about to go out and begin their student teaching. And uh, they were so, I guess the word might be scared, <laughs> and they, <laughs> they were desperate to hear anything at all that, that would be an indication of what they were in for when they came into the classroom. So I brought quotes from my own students to them, saying, hey, how would you like to hear what students would give advice about? And they were very eager to hear. And I thought to myself, you know, they wrote it down word for word, all the quotes that I brought from my students. And I thought, you know, there's a market for this. I think there should be some kind of a guide, a book for, for the kind of practical information that it's not possible 
for colleges to give new teachers. Mm -hmm. No, I, th I think colleges and universities do a great job of getting the students out there into the schools as early as possible, but there are certain things that you can't really learn until you're there on the job experiencing it. And I wanted to be able to bring that to some of the younger people. So what's the name of your book? It's called Classroom Advice for New Teachers, a proactive approach for meeting the daily challenges of the profession. All right, and I like the fact that it says advice. Right, there's Take not any one it. way. Take right. it or leave it. You Absolutely, know? it's just my impression of what I picked up through the years as the how to navigate this career the best. And the main theme in it is something we've already touched on here, uh, just through basic human decency and just by being there as a part of the students' lives. It can often play a really significant role and it is a great privilege to be able to do that. I think this is the correct quote, they, that teaching is the noble art. I think it is. I, believe, no. I think it goes back to Socrates and Plato and all those guys. Right. That, that to, to impart information, to share whatever it is you're sharing, it's an art form. Now I want to be careful about how I say this here on your show because <laughs> Sometimes teachers... So let me say it and then you okay. don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that um, if we do too much in the area of saying we're heroes, that turns off a lot of people who are not teachers who say, look, I work really hard, we're yeah, all important. Yeah, yeah. I, I save I, lives every day. I, right. Know. Well, and then as you get towards the summer, if you're at a you know Memorial Day barbecue, you'll mm -hmm. have people who say, well... Summer's coming up. You must be pretty happy about now, huh? You know, you're going to have a whole, you know, the oh, rest of us don't yeah, get that kind of. Yeah. So, uh, some you know, teacher, you know my response is to that? What's that? Your mother never told you you couldn't be a teacher. That, true, <laughs> true, true, true. Well, you know, early on, maybe the response is one of uh, anger and defensiveness, saying, you don't know how much work we do. Yeah. But I found that that kind of attitude just makes more resentment it's among a different people. Kind of, it's just totally and different. I think I've I think stumbled upon what I think works the best. There are snarky answers like, well it's not too late for you, why don't you just <laughs> But you know, that ultimately doesn't help because the person walks away saying, Well, that's a person who's really not very grateful for the job he's got. I think gratitude and humility. You know, if you are grateful for the advantages of the job and whatever they may be, even summer vacation, and but have enough humility to say, we are very, very fortunate to be in a position to play this role in the lives of our students. Uh, if that's the approach that you take with the general public, I think that maybe they'll walk away saying, well, maybe the profession is a, a good one after all. And it's not for everybody. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think when you first go into it many times, especially for high school teachers, they have a love for their subject. Maybe they love chemistry, love math, love great literature. I thought I would be spending my days discussing complex historical perspectives or great literary works. And the truth is you can do those things, but you find out immediately when you first set foot in the classroom that it is not really about the subject as much as it's about your connection with the students. Mm -hmm. And that became a theme throughout the book. Uh, through all the different levels of being a teacher, what remains constant is you have to build connections with students and that's what lives on long into the future. You're leading me to the to, to the, my my next point here is before the show you were talking to me about the connections with students so why don't you connect me with one of those stories that you in my audience. Oh there are many many um, one that I stumbled into um, and at first, that's usually how it happens. You don't know how to really make a connection. It's an intuitive and, thing sometimes. Yeah, and sometimes just basic human decency and mm -hmm. sometimes it's even fear. In, in my case, I, I was, my first job, uh, I was thrown into the situation where I had to direct the school play. I didn't have any idea how to do that. And I cast as the lead role a, a student that I thought would fit the characteristics of that role really well. Uh, immediately I was bombarded with students and even teachers who said, wow, you made a huge mistake here. He's going to ruin the whole thing. He had one line last year in the play and couldn't even say that the right way. And I thought, oh, what am I going to do now? Um, I can't just say to him, sorry, no one thinks you can do this. You're out. Maybe out of timidness, maybe out of compassion, I just said, oh, I'm going to 
I'm just going to praise him every chance I get when he does things the right way. And so he'd struggle to read on the script through the play, and every once in a while he'd say something correct. And at that point I'd say, hey, that was really good. Nice job with that. You're really getting this. And every once in a while the students started joining in, saying, you know, that really wasn't half bad. He'd see me in the hallway and say, hey, look, I've got my script. By the time the show had happened, um, I was waiting out uh, outside the doors, and the doors burst open, people were streaming out, and almost all I heard was, can you believe that was him up there <laughs> saying those lines so dramatically, so passionately? And, and you were uh, saying there was some Shakespeare. Uh, there was, he had, a, his character had to quote Shakespeare, and um, at first he had trouble even just reading it off the script. By the end, the audience was just completely floored. That, that he was able to do this in such a dramatic way. And before he graduated, he, he wrote a note to me saying, you are the only person in my life who ever believed in me, and I'll remember that till the day I die. Now, some professions are rewarded with pay raises and mm -hmm. large amounts of money and other perks, and I think a note like that is the kind of reward that, that we get as teachers. Right, there, you can't put up any value on that other than it just, it's part, you know, wow. There's nothing, nothing heroic on my part. I didn't know any better. Yeah. It was just a basic act of kindness or of mercy, maybe, to let him continue to try this. And it ended up having a large impact on his life. So I think more so than calling ourselves uh, heroes, I think that we're just very fortunate to be in the kind of a career where just basic decency and just the fact that we're there with them uh, results in an effect that students might remember forever. Yep, you know, and and I think it's it's that connectivity you were talking about when we first started here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned college, and you were doing a presentation at the college level. I recall when myself and other teachers first started teaching, there seemed to be a big disconnect, and I think they've done a better job of it. But do you still see a disconnect with the theory and? Uh, the practicalities of the pedagogy of teaching. Yeah. Uh, and I remember one instructor was making us right on the blackboard and yeah. making sure our handwriting was correct. Really? Sure. And when I, you know, I, I got to be a teacher, it was like, none of that pertained. Sure. It was like, like, wow, big, big gap there. You still see that or no? I thought about this very carefully through the years. And uh, early in your career, you tend to have the idea that the things that I learned in college are cutting edge and I'm going to do things differently than teachers currently do them. I'm going to show them the new way of doing things and my <laughs> way is the right way. Then, then you have a similar kind of focus later in your career where you say, I don't know what these new people are talking about. I know the right way to do it. The I was tried thinking and about true that methods. on the way over here. Right. right? So yeah. you have your both ends of things where the, er, the young teachers think they know best, older teachers think they know best. I think that the truth is you have to keep yourself open to what works the best for you. Whether it's a new idea, an old idea, anything in between, try it. There are some students it will work for. Try a different idea, there are other students that will especially resonate with. And by the time you've gone through your career, you have a, I guess, a repertoire of, of techniques that you use that you find work. Not everything works for everybody. Right. In my first teaching job, I observed one of my veteran colleagues there was a student misbehaving, and he got his attention by slamming his fist on the desk. Bang! And the kid jumped to attention, and I thought, wow, I'm going to use that. <laughs> and, and so in my, I had a student who was turned around to speak to the, uh, the student behind him, and I came up to his desk, and went, bang, as hard as I could with my fist. And he jumped to attention and was startled. But his, the effect of that wore off on him within minutes, but my hand was swollen for a week. <laughs> so who really got punished there? Yeah. And how much good did it really do? I think that all of us have to look at what works for ourselves. We have a tendency to sometimes not listen enough to our colleagues mm -hmm. and sometimes listen too much. Okay, and let's hold that thought because we have a listener that just called in. Oh my How's gosh. that for a segue? Wow. Good morning, caller. Well, good morning, Doc. It's Mike from Portland. It is. I figured you'd recognize my voice. <laughs> um, I started watching this morning. I I I, have, I was just telling Randy and on the telephone. I've had to miss some Saturdays, but uh, I, I saw you had a 
author today, but I didn't know an author of what. And uh, I'm really finding this, you know, I'm, I don't know the gentleman. I, I, I've never met him or anything, uh, but I'm finding his uh, uh, talk very interesting. Well, good. Thank you. You know, um, I, I don't even know if you know this doc, but I have had... I mean, you know I worked for Chautauqua County as an accountant for many years. Yes, but I also know you did other things. Okay. Did you did you know that I was a, a part-time lifeguard, swim instructor? I'm and all swimming that? right now. I'm, if you can see me. I see that. I, I see that. I, I know. You were, a, you were a coach, too, weren't you? Uh, no, I don't have my coaching certification. Okay. I, I knew you worked with swimmers. I knew that. Yeah. I had, I, I've helped out a lot with swim teams and stuff, mm -hmm. and I am still a swim official, uh, which means I go around, I mean, you probably know, but maybe the whole audience doesn't know, I go around to the different schools in Chautauqua and uh, Cattaraugus, and basically we're there to, you know, enforce the rules and watch and, you know, make sure everything is done uh, correctly. So some of what Jeff's talking about must be ringing true for you. It is, it is. Uh, uh, some, I'm, I'm surprised over the years, yeah, you do, you do make some connection. I think, I mean, more of the connections were more back when I was teaching, especially... Mm -hmm. You know, when I did the uh, swim instructions or I worked at the school, but mm -hmm. yeah, there is there is a, a, a lot of that connection. And I mean, you know, I've got like friends on Facebook that my first friend was our diver back in the day, <laughs> you know, or one of my first ones. Forever so, friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, it has been, uh, yeah, it is, it is rewarding, um, you know, definitely rewarding in that, in that manner. Um, but I thought I would touch base since it seemed at well, least, you. Uh, you know, at least come in halfway close <laughs> to. Anytime. You know, this is a live call in. Anytime. What I, what I did. Um, and, and like I say, I always enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, like I say, I've, I've still, I, I still uh, officiate to this day and, and probably will for hopefully many years to come. Go for it, yeah. I mean, if I can walk and think, <laughs> why, that's, you know. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> read. Then, <laughs> right. So. But I just did want to just uh, call in because well, I haven't in a while. Yeah, good to hear from you. And just uh, you. But let's. I think his name. Is, your guest is Jeff, right? Jeff, thank you. Jeff, Jeff Julian. Uh, Julian. Okay. Well, at least I got the J right. <laughs> Let him right. know I'm enjoying his uh, his talk today. All right. Well, thank soups. You. Thanks for calling in, Mike. All right. We'll, we'll see you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, there is an event that is seared in my memory. That what the caller was talking about with the connection. Um, I was at a meeting at an elementary school, and it was in the winter, and there was a blizzard. We looked out the window, and a student without a coat, a little elementary kid, was running from the school out into this blizzard <sighs> into the middle of nowhere. So, so what's the story there? Was it, uh, did he want to play in the snow? Probably not. He didn't, have, didn't even have a coat on. Um, do we have to lock the doors a little better? I think, though, a minute later you saw the principal out there running after him to catch him. <laughs> I have to admit, a part of me was thinking, wow, oh, I, I hope you make it, buddy. I hope you, hope you find what you're looking for. Run for us. <laughs> I, I think that maybe the accumulated effect of what was going on in the school, for, in all of us, all of us have to think about this as teachers. A student will get on the bus and maybe feel ostracized right from the start, Absolutely. step into the school building and people are yelling at him to hurry up and get where he's going. Um, he sits down and the kid next to him insults him, tries to sit at the lunch table. They say, keep walking, loser, can't yeah. sit here. And just the accumulated effect of everything that happens. Where's you down? Where's you down? Right, until for that particular kid, bolting out of the building into a blizzard without a coat was a better idea than staying in the building and experiencing what was there. And I think all of us have to think very carefully, are we making every single student feel welcome? Because if we do make a student feel welcome, it might be the only place in the whole world the student feels that way. Mm -hmm. And again, it's there's nothing heroic. It's just that we're in the position where basic human decency can have a long-term effect on, on so many people. Let's talk about the chapters in your book. Sure. So what, what do you cover, Jeff? Right from the start, I cover the decision to become a teacher. And I, much of what we've just been talking about is, mm -hmm. is a part of that and the great privilege that it is. Uh, right from interviewing, I go through many interviewing techniques. I teach public speaking at uh, JCC as well, and I cover an interviewing unit. I've had a lot of, uh, through being a department chair for 27 years, I've 
been in a, quite a few interviews, and I know what works and what doesn't, so I have a, a chapter on that. What's the big mistake there? Uh, I think a big mistake is sometimes you can answer a question honestly, but you may veer into negativity. And I think that no one wants to hear negativity from a prospective uh, employee. I think that the, the main theme that I stress there is to, to keep all of your comments positive and then link them back to positive experiences that you've had with students. I remember one day I was doing a bunch of interviews for pr prospective teachers mm -hmm. when I was superintendent and I had a pile of applications, literally that high, for right. I think it was uh, elementary. And I looked at the candidate and said to the candidate, tell me why I should hire you and not somebody in this pile. And they went, white. <laughs> they got their composure, Sure. they gave me a great answer, and the rest was history. They came on board and they were great. But that's the competition that's out there, is you gotta be very careful what you say. Absolutely. And I think for all of us, uh, it's easy to get bogged down in the day-to-day -day tasks that we've got. But I think it's important to remember the, the effect that we have on, on so many people and the honor that it is for right. us to do that. And if we keep that in mind, then as we're speaking to the public, as we're talking to the parents of our children, board members, neighbors, community members, um, remember that we're very fortunate to have this position. True or false? Okay. Not every teacher is a good fit for every school. Okay. I tend to have the, the point of view that each of us, as a different human being, brings a little something different to the table. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to see a faculty that some would call consistent, but I think that consistency can sometimes be a lack of variety for students. I like when teachers have their own ways of doing things, their own personalities, and in fact, in the book, I've encouraged uh, teachers to bring in their own perspective on life, their own talents and interests, to help enhance what they're trying to teach their students. Students really do appreciate that. And but, but, some, but there are people that apply sometimes, I find, they're expecting certain perks or certain communities, and they, they're not a good fit. I suppose that's true. But again, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to uh, eliminate anybody from any certain school, because you never know. The, the kids at that particular school might well, gain something. Well, I'm not something. saying we would eliminate. I'm saying the new teacher might think about sure. where do I want to work. Absolutely. That, that's where I'm going with this. Do I want city? Do I want rural? Do I want urban or, you know, suburban? Absolutely. Or whatever. And cause sometimes people will take on a job and will say, this isn't for me. So sure. kind of save yourself some wear and tear and think about it ahead of time. That's definitely true. And now with uh, modern technology, we can look all over the country <clears throat> at different opportunities that are out there and think about the kind of a place you'd like to be. But wherever it is you end up, it's still you have the situation where you're put in front of a classroom full of students, mm -hmm. and those students are looking to you for inspiration, or sometimes they don't even know they are. But the, <laughs> the vision of you as an adult in that room is having an effect on them that they're going to take with them the rest of their lives, even if it's tucked in the back of their memory. Okay, so after the interview, what's next? What's next? In your book. In your book. Well, okay, we've got uh, laying down the rules for students um, on the first day, how to set up your classroom. Um, when you're hired, sometimes if you're lucky enough to have your own classroom, um, you turn the key and open the door and find that you know the furniture is in a pile in the middle of the room and you have <laughs> no idea what to do? Where are your materials? How do you set up this room? And um, I, I think I have the point that I make that you want to set it up in such a way as to make students feel like someone wants them there. You know, if your room looks like a warehouse, and or if it looks sloppy, then it just appears that nobody cares that you're there, and the students want to feel welcome. And if your room looks, if you've got things uh, decorated to stimulate their senses and make them feel like someone here is happy that I'm here. And again, that might be the only place a student feels that way. I always try to set my room up like in a semicircle so I could That's, get to every student at any point in time perfectly. I do the same. Okay. Great for discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how to create tests how to set up your grade book. I mean, that's usually not something that is covered in a college class and there's so many different... Wouldn't you think it would be since right. they're crucial? I, I'm not blaming the colleges. There's a certain thing that they do well 
with a philosophy behind it, mm -hmm. but then there are other things that can only be gained by actually being in the situation in the school. And those are the kinds of things I've tried to cover. Um, all the way to um, inf the enforcement of rules, you know, how to go about doing that. You find that um, trying to govern through fear is very short-lived. Uh, it only works temporarily, and you find that you have to increase the amount of, uh, you know, the tone of your voice and yelling, and then the students develop a tolerance to it. At first, if you yell at kids, they'll say, well, we better not, we better not keep doing that, he's going to yell again. But then you find that you have to yell a little bit harder, a little bit louder to achieve the same effect the next How about time. this one? How many yeah. times do I have to tell you that? And the right. kid says, I don't know, about 4,000 times. <laughs> yeah, and the net effect is that then you're telling them something all period long in a louder and louder voice. Right. The kid then goes to the next class and experiences the same thing. The net effect of that is an unpleasant environment. And I think it's better when all of us realize there's a better way to do that. Make connections with each individual student. Um, they're not going to comply unless you gain their goodwill mm -hmm. and make that connection. True or false? Praise okay. can work against you. Praise too can work against Too much praise. To, like, okay. you know, the yes. first thing is all the gold stars all the time. It's, hey, everybody, look at Jeff. Look how good he did. Blah, 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 blah. And everybody, everybody hates Jeff after a while. Okay. I suppose that's true, but I think that what's important is to discriminate between uh, cheap flattery right. and honest, uh, uh, honest appreciation. There is a very distinct difference. When you pick out the good in a student, it has to be true. You have to make sure that you're picking out what really is there. If you are flattering them in a false way, they're going to pick up on it after a while and despise you for it. I always found... In in my experience, that if I quietly went up to the student and said, you know, Jeff, that was really good. You did a really good job. Thanks a lot. Right. Instead of saying, hey, everybody, this is Jeff, you know, and, and, right. and you put the kid on the spot and then everybody says, well, he didn't do that for me. You know, it's just a kind of a private type of thing. Is that That goes for behavior that needs to be oh. corrected as well. Yes. If you make a showdown and, uh, and it becomes like a gunfight at the OK Corral and the whole class is watching, you're not going to get the kind of cooperation from that student. Or if you do, it'll be very reluctantly on the student's part. Uh, I had a situation where a student slid his desk over next to a, a girl, and I said to him, uh, hey, why don't you move that back? You know, it's out of order. And he just sat there looking at me, <laughs> and I said, hey, didn't you hear me? I said, move it back. Now the whole class is watching. Uh, Some of them were urging uh, the kid, hey, don't get him mad, just move it back. So now it's public mm -hmm. display. And I finally caught myself and said, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't the right way. So I said to him, let's talk after class. So when the last student left, immediately he burst into tears and said, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to go against what you were saying. I just really like this girl. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I wanted to sit by her. And I felt like after you said that, I couldn't move because then I'd look like a weakling. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. So if you allow the student to save face and to maintain his dignity, that's where you're going to get the cooperation. If you make it a power play, that's just not what's good for anybody. I'll tell you a horror story real quick. Sure. I was the regional administrator of BOCES at uh, Hughes Center. Get a call. Dr. Hamels, there's, a, there's an issue in the cafeteria. And I'm going like, oh, okay. I walk in this kid swearing and carrying on. So I quietly go up to him and I put my arm on him like this and say, come with me. Yeah. And he's throwing his arms. He's you know, swinging at me. Don't touch me. And of course, everybody's going, ooh. And I'm going like, I don't know how you touch this kid. So I just, come with me, come with me. So he came with me, and we sat down. He came right down, and he said, I've been abused as a kid, and anybody that touches me makes me nuts. And he says, I'm sorry, I was upset, it won't happen again. Same case. Very, we've had a lot of similar experiences, yeah, I can yeah. tell. But it goes to show that every single one of those <laughs> students out there is walking around with his or her own set of, of hopes and dreams and sadness and uh, all kinds of disappointments and successes and they're all bundled up together and that's who we're dealing with when we look out at a whole classroom full of students. We need to keep that in mind that there are really important things happening in their lives other than what we're talking to them about. Jeff, we're getting down to about four minutes so let's flash up <clears throat> the picture of your book and keep telling us what, uh, what other things we can expect in your book. Sure, well <clears throat> um, it travels all the way from the decision, oh that was when I was very excited, that was when the first shipment arrived. Uh, <laughs> you touch yeah, it, you can feel yeah, it. Yeah, the first shipment arrived it was... Your uh, name was spelled right. <laughs> yes, it, it, 
from uh, Roman and Littlefield Publishers. It was like winning the lottery. Mm. I didn't want to do any self-publishing. I wanted instead for it to be a really legitimate college textbook publisher. And this one picked it up and gave me the contract. I just felt like I won the lottery. Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes all the way from making the decision to become a teacher all the way through uh, setting up your classrooms, setting up grading systems, uh, making tests, uh, dealing with discipline issues, making connections with students, how to handle your colleagues, how to handle your administrators. Yeah. Now, I, well, now, I have a, a sympathetic view of administrators. They are in a position where uh, they've earned the right to try things their own way. It's our job to implement those ideas. Right. And uh, sometimes the, we have to look at things from another person's perspective. Now, I've not ever been an administrator, but... Uh, each one of us has struggles and an agenda and things to accomplish, and uh, we need to be sympathetic to that as teachers. Uh, try things the way your administrator is asking you to. There's plenty of time to do things your own way as well. And if someday you want to become an administrator, you'll have the right to try it your way. <laughs> um, and, and the book continues on through using modern technology. Oh, I've got a few testimonials on the, mm -hmm. on the back cover from some of my colleagues who are kind enough to, uh, to write those. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, through the use of technology, all the way to avoiding late career burnout. I also have uh, a couple of appendices on the back that talk about uh, different activities that you can use uh, for engaging the students. Um, we mentioned the use of music. That happens to be one of my own particular interests. And because I played that one time with you in front of our students that my first year of teaching, it, it started throughout my career now in order to uh, help get across the ideas. I'll use a little name that tune kind of thing. I'll bring out my guitar and harmonica and mm -hmm. a little foot tambourine and a wrist <laughs> maraca and, you know, play songs and intersperse with those songs uh, questions from the material that we're covering in class. And it's just a fun way to review the information that we're covering if you throw in a little music yeah. with it. And there are other teachers who are great at artwork or athletics. Mm -hmm. and There are always ways to mix in your own personal talents and interests with making it more engaging for students. Now, um, Jeff, our uh, engineer just popped up your website. So this is yes. how somebody get it. So for those of you that are listening over on WRFA, it's Thank Jeff you. Julian, author. That's all one word, right? That's Jeff correct. Julian. So it's Jeff and J-U-L-I-A-N, author, dot, GQ. GQ. What is GQ? Well, uh, maybe I'm stepping up in the world. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've never no, seen that before. No, it's <clears throat> it's just a, uh, a a way to make the website a little easier to get to. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, how much is the book? It's uh, twenty five dollars online, mm -hmm. and uh, there's also an ebook that you could download to your Kindle or All device. Right. But I appreciate you putting up that that website up there. That's the quickest way to get to it. It's on Amazon. Barnes & Noble, or the, the publisher's website of uh, Roman and Littlefield. But check your favorite bookseller. It'll surely be there. Okay. we got about a minute left from what I'm hearing. So what would be your, if you could talk to a brand new teacher right now, what story yeah. would you share with them? Tell, tell that story told. Okay. Oh, uh, we ran out of time. I just found out we ran out of time. Darn it all. Well, we'll have to do this another time. I will be very happy to come back anytime. Jeff Thank Julian, you. It's a author of Classroom yeah. Advice for New Teachers. This may be a great gift to a high school student that's thinking about going into education. Jeff, you teach at Maple Grove Junior and Senior High. That's correct. You're available. Check out his book, everybody. Doggone it, I have more questions. That's what teachers do. We'll see you all again next Saturday morning right here. In on channel 1301 on Access Chautauqua. Have a great weekend, and Jeff, thanks again, and good luck to your book. Thank you. Are you going to write another one? Absolutely. All I'm right. in the middle of it already. <laughs> okay. Take care.